Yeah, okay. You see my screen? Yes. Ah, okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. So my name is uh, Boumedian Hamzi and I am uh, my career fellow at uh, the Department of uh, Mathematics. So it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this uh, special lecture by uh, Professor uh, Wenan O e, that will be inaugurating this uh, special interest group on uh, machine learning and dynamical systems. And that will be hosted by the Alan uh, Turing Institute. So the current members of the, of the SIG are listed uh, in, the, in the first slide and then um, yeah, you are welcome to join us and we will give you more details uh, later on. So this uh, special interest group is part of some efforts that we have uh, been uh, making to, uh, to organize the area, the research area, the intersection of machine learning and uh, dynamical systems. So we had the uh, first symposium on machine learning and dynamical systems at uh, Imperial College London in uh, February <coughs> 2019. And then we had uh, another one uh, in September 2020, that was hosted online by the Fields Institute. So this SIG is part of this uh, of this efforts. So the, the the general context of this research is directly related to the question of uh, how to analyze uh, complex systems. So among uh, the current approaches, uh, we can find the theory of dynamical systems that allows to analyze uh, complex systems when the model is uh, is now. So it offers uh, non-trivial ways to analyze dynamical systems. It has the status of theory, and uh, but currently it is limited to uh, low-dimensional models. Uh, on the other side, I mean, machine learning is concerned with uh, algorithms designed to uh, accomplish a certain task uh, whose performance improves with the input of more data. It allows the analysis of some very uh, high-dimensional complex systems on the basis of uh, when the model is not even now. And uh, however, the current limitation is that it's mostly a set of techniques and uh, algorithms. There are no methodologies. The theory is still uh, underdeveloped and it's not clear why the algorithms work and uh, what is their domain of uh, applicability. So from the point of view of uh, philosophy of science, it makes sense to combine dynamical systems and machine learning, since most of the scientific method, the modern scientific methods combines between uh, elements of uh, rationalism and empiricism. And in our case, uh, empiricism is manifest in uh, machine learning and uh, rationalism is manifest in the theory of uh, dynamical systems. Uh, so the goal here of this uh, research uh, direction is to fill the gap between the, these uh, two fields of machine learning and dynamical systems and the following directions. Uh, machine learning for uh, dynamical systems, where the goal is uh, to study how to analyze the dynamical systems on the basis of observed data, rather than attempt to study them analytically. So this uh, will allow to extend the boundaries of the classical theory of dynamical systems. And the other direction is uh, dynamical systems for uh, machine learning, uh, where the goal is how to analyze uh, algorithms of machine learning using tools from the theory of dynamical systems. So uh, here, uh, the goal is to uh, give solid foundations to the existing methods and understand their true potential and limits uh, in view of identifying the domain of uh, applicability of the, of the algorithms in machine learning. Uh, so as pointed out by Steve Smale about uh, 15 years ago in the introduction of uh, one of the books on uh, approximation theory, so he mentioned that uh, the unification of uh, dynamical systems and uh, learning theory is uh, a major problem. And, uh, and another problem is also to uh, develop a comparative study of useful algorithms uh, currently available and to give them uh, unity. Uh, and he meant uh, within the context of uh, machine learning and dynamical systems. Uh, from the personal point of view, I mean, this is the SIG and the symposia are directly related to uh, uh, personal uh, intellectual journey that I started about like 10 years ago when I was interested uh, in the intersection of machine learning and dynamical system but the, through uh, meeting uh, Jake Bouvre at Duke University where we're at, uh, both working. So we were interested in combining between tools of uh, uh, machine learning and control and dynamical systems. We ended up working on the kernel methods for uh, dynamical systems. Uh, and then uh, now I'm really happy that we have this uh, uh, entire area. We have so many other techniques. I'm looking forward to learning from everyone uh, in this uh, in this field. So the website of uh, the SIG is the is on the on the Turing uh, webpage, 
so the talks will be recorded and uh, posted to you too. So if you not want to be uh, in the recording, then please uh, have your, your video turned off. There will be other organizational details that will be uh, described by uh, OBMAC immediately after Wayne and Earl's uh, talk. And for updates about the SIG, uh, please send us an email and we'll add it to the mailing list. So now uh, I'll be happy to introduce uh, Professor uh, Wayne and Earl, and then he'll be talking about uh, machine learning and the MP system. Hey, uh, Boumedian, just a, a moment. I see there are a lot of people in the waiting room. Do you have a oh, yeah. Or yeah, oh, yeah, admit all. I think that, yeah. I'll let you do it. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. So, well, yeah, you can go ahead and share, share your, your screen. Can you see it now? No. Can you see no. it? Can you see my screen? No, we don't, actually. You don't? So what everyone is seeing is, are they seeing my screen or? Uh... Yeah, we're, we're seeing you, actually. What are we seeing? You. You. Here we go. Now we see Wayne and yeah. All right. Yeah. It's okay, it's okay. Okay, okay please, uh, everyone, with everyone. Yeah. Yeah, okay, you can go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, yeah, thank you, yeah. Should I, should I just start or? <laughs> yeah, please, thank you. Okay, so let me. Okay, so, um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. Um, well, machine learning and dynamic systems uh, uh, is a very, um, I, I feel, I, I feel it's a very, uh, going to be a very productive area, actually, um, Bomini met, largely thanks to Bomini's effort uh, through organizing these two workshops, and now, I'm sure now this uh, activity group, there will be more, uh, much more uh, effort uh, devoted to this area. Um, so, I'll be talking about joint work with the um, a lot of my former students or students, Jiechun Han, Chen Xiaoli, these are former students, this is a current student, Chao Mai is a former student, this is also a former student, and that's a former collaborator, it's a collaborator. So, um, okay, I, I want to sort of uh, classify these, the, the, the topics that uh, we are interested in into three categories. Namely, machine learning of dynamic systems, by dynamic systems, for dynamic systems. Now, by dynamic systems, that's clear. So that's using machine learning, using dynamic systems to do machine learning. Uh, Bomini just explained this. Um, uh, of dynamic systems. So this is a really um, um, the issue of model reduction. We started with a very large, complicated dynamic system. We want to reduce it. And for dynamical systems, that's we we are interested in a particular uh, aspect of, of a dynamical system, say some some experimental experimental measurements, and we will want to um, learn a model to predict that experimental data. So this is this is really a supervised learning of time series. So I like to uh, make a difference between these two. So let me first start with some general remarks. First of all. Machine learning can do wonders. So here is, a, here is an example, a very typical example uh, of the kind of things machine learning can do. So this is supervised learning. We're given some data set. This is a very well-known data set, CIFAR can, which is a, 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 a collection of images. Each image contains some uh, content, and these contents are in one of the 10 categories. So an image, an image can, maybe it's about a deer, about a dog or horse, et cetera. So the task is to learn a function that maps each image into its category, namely its content. So this, each image is a point, can be viewed as a point in a very high dimensional space, 32 by 32, that's the number of pixels, times the three, that's the dimensionality of the color space. So we're learning a function in a 3072 dimensional space to 10 discrete values. These are the kind of things that 
supervised learning or machine learning can do very well now. Let me um, explain the sort of the general idea of how deep neural network works, namely the deep neural network stochastic gradient descent paradigm uh, for supervised learning, for example. So there are three major components. The first component is just to choose the hypothesis space. So that's the set of functions that we're going to use to fit the target function. By the way, going back, supervised learning is about, is, you know, in this case of supervised learning, we, uh, there is some target function we're interested in. We're interested in, uh, to approximate that target function. We're giving a finite set of values of that target function, a finite number of points. And the task is to approximate that function f star. So that's, that, that was task. Anyway, <clears throat> so the first component is, is to choose the hypothesis space. For example, this is an example of a two layer neural network, two layers, because there's two sets of parameters, aj and omega, uh, wj, and oops, um, sigma is a nonlinear scalar activation function. So that's, for example, this is a very popular choice. And that sigma makes the set of trial functions nonlinear. Otherwise, those would just be a linear model. So you can also choose other kind of trial functions. For example, classically, one would do piecewise polynomials, Fourier series, weblets, that's that, that kind of trial functions. In, uh, in, in, in machine learning, we typically choose neural networks. Um, the second step is to choose a loss function. You want to choose, the, you want to use that loss function to find the optimal parameters, aj and, and wj. So that's formulating an optimization problem. Since we are given a finite no, uh, number of data values, the easiest thing to do, the most obvious thing to do is to fit the data. So now this sort of L2 loss function is the most commonly used. This is called empirical risk. Keep in mind that what we really want to minimize is what is called the population risk. This is the, this, we, we have to work with this because we only give, give uh, we're only given a finite piece of data. But we really, what we really want to do is this. The third step is to choose an algorithm to optimize this function. For example, gradient, uh, gradient descent algorithm, that, that would be this. In order to do this gradient descent, we have to capture the gradient of of the loss function, of this uh, empirical loss function. Now, that's a sum of n terms where n is a, a size of a data set and that can be expensive. So a stochastic version of this is to just randomly sample one term from this average. That's a stochastic gradient descent. So this is the typical DNN SGD paradigm. Now, let me give you some hint why neural networks work in such high dimension, some simple hints. This, let's consider this kind of representation. So this is a very uh, well-known popular represent, way of representing functions by its Fourier transform. A omega would be just, A would be just be the Fourier transform of, of F star, F star target function. Associated with this representation is the uh, Fourier approximation. That would be this. This is what we call Fourier method, where omega j here is a uniform grid. Now this approximation does not work in high dimension because the error goes like this, where D is the dimensionality, alpha is typically associated with the smoothness of the target function F star, and M is the number of total, total number of free parameters. So why, so why doesn't this work? Because there is a curse of dimensionality here. If you want to reduce the error by uh, uh, to some error tolerance epsilon, the number of parameters needed is epsilon to the minus d over alpha. If you choose alpha to be one, for example, then, uh, and, and epsilon to be 0.1, then m would be 10 to the d. If d is 3,000, this is a huge number. So this is why Fourier methods or piecewise polynomials, you know, finite elements, all that kind of stuff don't work in high dimension. Now, if we, if, um, so in high dimension, there's one thing that works, namely uh, calculating integrals. We know the Fourier, uh, the uh, Monte Carlo integration uh, works very well in high dimension. That's why people in statistical physics can calculate integrals um, with um, you know, millions of dimensions. So 
in, in that regard, we would like to, we expect that the best we can do is something like uh, Monte Carlo. So that would be this kind of error, uh, error rate, convergence rate. Now this can be achieved if the target function F star is represented like this. The only difference between this representation and the Fourier representation is that in the Fourier representation, we had a D omega here. So now that D omega is replaced by pi of D omega, where pi is the probability distribution. And then this target function can be expressed as a uh, expectation. We can use Fourier, uh, we are, sorry, we can use Monte Carlo to calculate this, uh, to approximate this expectation. The error is given uh, exactly by this formula. You can see that the, convert, uh, the, the error rate does not depend on dimension. Notice that this thing here is nothing but a two layer neural network with this particular activation function. So what's say, what I'm saying here is that for functions that admits this kind of representation, they can be approximated by two layer neural networks with a convergence rate that's independent of dimensionality. Okay, now <clears throat> that's also true in more general case. For example, um, uh, we can choose sigma to be a more general activation function as long as the target function can be represented in this form. The function f star can be approximated by two layer neural networks and the convergence rate would be independent of dimensionality. So we call this integral transform based representation of the target function. What I like to remark here is that I'm only giving an example here for the two layer neural networks, but the, um, uh, but the, um, our, the our theoretical work has indicated that behind, behind each of these um, neural network models, there's some expectation structure. What I'm saying here is that this expectation structure is associated with two layer neural, neural networks uh, for three, four, five, you know, multi layer neural networks, there's also some expectation structure, but it's just more complicated than this. So that's a very important issue. And there are many, um, many, a lot of progress has been made actually uh, towards a mathematical understanding of neural network models. And if you're interested, you can take a look at this review article, <clears throat> which is posted on my webpage. There's lots of things that we don't know, but I'd like to emphasize that, that it's not totally a black box. Most people still think of deep learning, machine learning, uh, neural network models as being a set of black box, um, uh, black magic. I would say that's not the case anymore, even though there's still a lot of very important deep questions that are still remain. Okay, so let me start with the, the first topic, namely machine learning by dynamical systems. So here we're trying to use dynamical system to generate trial functions in high positive space. And we like to, in this regard, we like to formulate machine learning as a control problem. And we like to develop new algorithms based on this idea. Before I get into that, let me just you know, discuss the usual stuff, namely multi-layer neural networks. I'm sure you have seen this picture. This is the input layer, say x1, x2, x3, x4. Here you put in your input and then there, there are hidden layers and the output is your target function approximate, approximation to the target function. Now this kind of structure is associated with a neural network model like this. So where W0x would be here, W0 would be these guys. So um, each link is, a, is an entry in the matrix W0. And then you, know, you have, and WL will be here. And then you have the function F. And this denotes as, you know, that the, the scale of the function sigma which is a scalar function and when it's applied to a vector is um, the action is component wise. Okay, so that can be formulated as a simple dynamical system. So um, in this way, where Z zero will be just this and we have this simple dynamical system. And then, um, and this was noted by uh, Lacoon from this, from this kind of analogy, he, he uh, um, uh, formulate the back propagation algorithm. Now, let me give you some uh, uh, one example of how this kind of idea can help us 
So let's look at this multi-layer neural network function. When we do gradient descent, we need to capture the gradient. Now the gradient, if we apply the gradient operator, then symbolically the gradient looks like this, where Ws are these, are these matrices. Of course, there is stuff in between, which I neglected. But it looks like some you know, product of a collection of matrices. And in dynamic systems, we would dynamic system kind of ideas would suggest that there is some Lyapunov exponent kappa, and this whole thing would grow like a Lyapunov exponent to the L, which is the number of layers. And if L is bigger than one, this is the exponential growth of the gradient. And indeed, this is associated with the explosion and vanishing gradient problem. And, and that's, a, that's really a huge problem in terms of training multi-layer neural networks. Uh, it's, it, it, it's a numerical instability. So instead, instead of using this kind of neural networks, it is much better, much more stable to use this kind of neural networks where you don't update the whole function, but rather only the, only the residual. You update only the residual, the leading order is the Z here. And that's called resi uh, 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 residual networks. Okay, that's much more stable and easier, e much easier to train. Okay, now let me now get into the, you know, the real content of the talk. Let's try to formulate, to try to uh, generate hypothesis functions, trial functions using dynamical systems of this type. Here, phi is some function of z and u. u is called a feature vector. And this is just some, you know, say some general nonlinear function. You can think of this as, uh, you know, one, sorry, this my thing doesn't seem to work. You can think of, um, this as a particular form of phi, where a and w are, are u. Anyway, but you can think of other general functions of phi. And, and I'm considering right-hand side of this form. You might ask why I'm considering right-hand side looks, that looks like this, where rho tau is a probability distribution at time tau. So um, the answer to that is that there, you know, one can prove theorems, which tells us that this is the most general form. Anyway, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip that part. So I'm gonna just use this kind of dynamical systems and to generate nonlinear maps, you know, time one maps. And then I add all the components together to generate functions. And these kinds of functions would be functions in now hypothesis space. Here, the, we can think of this as a control problem and the control would be this, these guys row tau. So the control is a one parameter family of probability distributions. And we want to choose these control so that the population risk is minimized. Remember, we want to minimize population risk. So this is a control problem. As a control problem, we can write down the maximum principle, comprise the maximum principle. To do that, we define this Hamiltonian, define, which is defined in the state, co-state, and control space. Um, the control here is probability distribution, remember. So this is the Hamiltonian, of, uh, uh, Hamiltonian function. Max, maximum principle says that the optimizer, the optimal control is the argmax of this expected Hamiltonian. And the state and the co-state satisfy this Hamiltonian system with these kinds of boundary conditions. So this is just typical Pondrage's maximum principle. Now, in machine learning, people don't do maximum principle. So I'm gonna discuss maximum principle later. But in machine learning, people don't do maximum principle. In machine learning, people do gradient descent. So let's first write down the dynamics for the gradient descent. In order to do that, let me give a small, small detour. The, because the, the, the uh, parameters here is a probability distribution. So how do we write down gradient descent where the parameter is a probability distribution? Well, the idea is as follows. Suppose we wanna minimize some function now of a probability distribution pi. Um, and you want to write down the gradient descent dynamics. The recipe is as follows. We define the chemical potential, which is just the L2 gradient. And then we apply something like Fick's law in physics. That's just this the velocity is given by the negative of the gradient of the chemical potential. And then we write down the continuity equation where the current is defined, defined by the density times the velocity. So this is the gradient flow uh, for the, in, the probability, in the space of probability, probability measures. One can show that if the solution is smooth, then the solution will 
uh, uh, will uh, be probability distribution. And this gradient flow happens to be also the gradient flow of this functional under the Wasserstein metric, as the well known. So we're going to just follow this recipe and apply to our problem. But for our problem, we have a one parameter family of probability distributions to optimize. Remember, rule of tau, the, uh, depending on parameter tau. And the, the recipe, if we follow the recipe, and the gradient flow is given as follows, where the chemical potential is defined here, and the uh, gradient flow is defined by this one parameter family of gradient flows, one equation for each tau. And these guys are coupled together through this forward and backward equation. Well, if you, this is the first time you've seen this, this looks like a mess, but let me say that, that if we discretize this, suppose we discretize this set of coupled PDEs, and then, um, why it doesn't work? Okay, then we use the simplest discrimination, namely we replace the population risk by the, um, by the uh, empirical risk using just using the training data. We discretize the control dynamics by forward Euler. We discretize the forward backward equation by forward Euler and backward Euler. And we discretize the gradient flow by the particle method. This, why particle method? Because particle method is the one numerical method that works in high dimension. It's a dynamic analog of Monte Carlo. So suppose we do that, then we re, then the then the particles, then the, the parameters become the position of, of these particles. The dynamics of the particles is defined by this gradient descent dynamics. Actually, this one can show that it's not it, this is nothing but the gradient descent algorithm for residual networks. So what I'm saying here is that by looking at this. Uh, this uh, uh, continuous formulation and then discretize, we actually, using particle method, we actually uh, recover the gradient descent algorithm for residual neural, network, residual neural networks. Now, this is the usual way. This is, this is the, the, the sort of the conventional way of um, performing optimization for uh, residual neural network models. But we don't have to do this, right? We can go back and think about the uh, maximum principle. We can develop algorithms based directly on this maximum principle. And this was done a couple of years ago. Um, and we just adopted the so-called method of successive approximation from control theory. And then you would get this op uh, algorithm, which is just a straightforward discretization of the maximum principle. Now this works, but not so well. It turns out one can, one can just extend the state space by adding the vectors B and Q and define this extended Hamiltonian, then the, the uh, extended uh, method of, uh, of successful approximation performs much better. We still don't understand why actually, but that's the empirical observation. If you compare maximum principle based algorithm with stochastic gradient descent, though the the maximum principle basis is the green line. And this is the, um, these are the different versions of stochastic gradient descent. The yellow is the atom, that's the most popular one. The, this light blue is the uh, uh, SGD, straightforward SGD. And this is eta grad, that's another version of stochastic gradient descent. Look, if you look at the training loss, the green line decays faster than, uh, than the other lines, particularly when the initialization is bad. So this is actually a good initialization. This is a bad initialization, uh, meaning that the initial amplitude of the parameters is, is large. Typically, that's a bad situation. And you, you, you can see that in this case, um, the maximum principle-based algorithm decays, uh, converges much faster. OK, so okay, this is a, so the kind of ideas we can sort of adopt from dynamic systems control theory, and then apply to great, uh, deep learning. Uh, I'm gonna give you some comments about these kind of ideas at the end. So let me now go to the second part, machine learning of dynamic systems. So here, where our task is just the model reduction. We're given a very complicated dynamic system with four observations, which we assume can observe everything. And we just wanna find a much smaller dynamic system that approximates this complicated dynamic system. Traditional way of doing this, is to do some PCA 
and then do some you know, approximation because you need to do some truncation here. Now, the machine learning based approach is what I'm gonna talk about. And this, there's lots of work that's done in, in this direction. You look at the uh, talk of Nathan Kutz in uh, MSML 2020 this year, last summer. So Nathan gave a, gave a, a, a summary of this. So here, we're, what we're concerned with is that we want to have short-term accuracy. So at on order one time scale, we want this small dynamic system to approximate the big dynamic system accurately. And on longer, long time scale, we want them to, to have, uh, we want to have qualitative correctness. For example, if you have a Hamiltonian system, we want it to stay Hamiltonian system. If we had a dissipative system to begin with, we want it to stay as a dissipative system. So we also want to keep, uh, you know, physically correct structure, for example, you know, that's what I just said. And if we, if the reduced model has inter uh, is interpretable, that would be great also. So how do we achieve this? I'm gonna just give you one instance. Namely, let's look at uh, the Anzac principle. So Anzac principle is a general, um, uh, um, so here the idea is the following. So if you look at uh, physical models like Navier-Stokes equation, uh, like um, uh, equations for liquid crystals, for uh, polymer fluids and stuff like that, the basic requirement is that they satisfy the physical laws of conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. And then the second law of thermodynamics. And the second law of thermodynamics is usually formulated as the Anzaga principle. So <clears throat> Anzaga started looking at this, I think in the 30s, actually got a Nobel Prize for this. So Anzaga principle says the following, that, that you know, the physical system can often be formulated in the form like this, where this is the positive definite symmetric matrix, matrix function, this is the anti-symmetric, and this is some energy and this is some external forcing. So these, um, um, you know, there is a, uh, something called generalized thermodynamics or non-equilibrium thermodynamics. It's in this same spirit, and that's an important topic in non-equilibrium thermodynamics or, or non-equilibrium statistical physics. Okay, so we want to <clears throat> we want to make sure that our reduced system is in this same form, so that these requirements, short-term accuracy and long-term quality of correctness, can both be obeyed be satisfied. So how do we do this? Well, there, first we need to find a good set of coordinates, H. Okay. Second, we need to determine these functions that occur here. So for H, we can do PCA. We can also do order encoder. That's a, that's a machine learning model that uses the neural network. So sort of a neural network version of PCA, one might say, nonlinear PCA. And then, so this gives us H, the generalized coordinates, and then some, some other neural network model would tell us, would, would enable us to find approximations of these functions. So for example, we can formulate this, formulate this uh, idea in terms of a loss function that looks like this. There are three terms here. The first term is the autoencoder. We want to make sure we, we, have, we have, the original variable is U, that U is a huge dimensional um, uh, dynamical system. And the reduced variable is phi of U. That's the, that's the new coordinates. So we want to make sure that after, after reduction, there's also a sort of decoding map to psi that allows us to recover the maximum information about U. Therefore, this kind of error is minimized. So that's the first term. The second term is to say, oh, there are dynamics. If I look at the dynamics, original dynamics, and look at the dynamics from, the, from what, we, what is called the reduced model, namely, namely, sorry, this, namely this guy. By the way, we're going to we call this Anzac net. You can, you can see that the dynamics are the same, are close enough. The reduced dynamics and the original dynamics for the projected variable, for the reduced variable, the dynamics are the same. And thirdly, we want their, 
we want to have some sort of isometry so that their distance are not very far apart. We want to preserve distance. So that's the three terms. Okay, so you can cook up other form, uh, uh, optimization problems, but the spirit will be similar. So let me look at uh, uh, an application. So this is the Ready Bernard convection the, uh, in two dimension. The, these, this is the Navier Stokes Bolognese equation for the velocity field and for the temperature field. We can define ready number, Prandtl number, and there's a you know, critical ready number, and, and, and there's a scaled ready number and stuff like that. We generate data from direct simulation of this PDE. You can see that's how it looks like, this plumes. And then, you know, at different um, ready, scaled ready number. So this is a very well-known problem. You know, we, we use Fourier, you know, you know Fourier-Lejeune method to solve this. So this is a very well-known problem in fluid mechanics, modeling convection. Now, the key question we're interested in is whether the Lorentz system is a good approximation to this dynamic. Remember, Lorentz divide, derived the very well-known Lorentz model by looking at this set of PDE and then do Fourier expansion and then just keep two modes two modes in the stream function. So we were using stream function, not just not the velocity, he was using stream function. And the one mode in, in, in the temperature. That's how we derive you know, the Lorentz system. That's how the Lorentz system looks like. And these are typical trajectories of Lorentz system. So how, whether Lorentz system actually um, approximates the original convection problem well. So that's what we, that's one issue we're interested in. So we, we can just use this Anzac net with different M. M is the size of the dimensionality of H, the size of the reduced system. And then we, we can look at the results. For example, if, so here there, we're looking at three modes. In each picture, there, 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 um, there's six set of curves, three pairs of curves. So one is from a direct, um, from original, Convection problem, Bernard convection problem, and the that, that's the dashed line, and the solid line is from the Anzac net. And you can see as you increase the number of modes from three, four, five, seven to nine, the agreement becomes, you know, but better and better. If you just look at three, so like Lorentz, then okay, you know, it's not great after like one and a half period or two periods, the DV, well, one, you know, almost like one period, the deviation is, is clear. Point-wise accuracy is lost. Okay. Point accuracy of the trajectory is lost. If you look at the phase portrait for m equal to nine, then you can see that, you know, it looks really like Lorentz <clears throat> in a way. <clears throat> this, is the, this is the P1 in the first three modes, P1, P2, and this is P1, P3. And remember in the onside thing, there is a potential function. This, this thing at the PDE level can be formulated like this. My Anzac net is also formulated like this, except it's an ODE in M dimension. So as I said here, for this particular set of parameters where the rate, scale rate number is 28, that's a typical number you, for, for Lorentz, you can see M equal to nine gives rather good accuracy. So qualitatively, it also gives you know, a nice phase portrait. And this, <coughs> this is the energy function we learned for m equal to three, five, seven, and nine. And you can see that you know, as, you, as, um, as we increase the number of modes, the, the energy function becomes more and more smooth. By the way, these three are, uh, are for the case when PCA is used to, to, to uh, select to choose the parameter, uh, to choose the variables h, the reduced coordinates h. And this is when autoencode is used. Here are the M with three modes. You can, if you compare this with this, you can see autoencoder performs much better. So there's also a nice energy function behind. That's good. So that's the second example. So here we're we, we started with some really huge dynamical systems and it would reduce the dynamical system to the small one. And the small dynamical system should have 
uh, both accuracy, uh, uh, short term accuracy and you know, long term qualitative correct behavior. Third, I'm going to look at machine learning for dynamic assessment. So, here we're interested in some particular observational data. For example, the total heat flux, heat flux from the bottom layer to the top layer in the con convection problem. And that's a time series. And we want to uh, formulate a model, find a model that would uh, predict this behavior of this time series accurately. So this is really a supervised learning problem. And the supervised, where, where, learn, where, input, the, where the input is a time series and the output is also a time series. The input could be like the bottom temperature that you impose. The output could be the total heat flux across the, the, the convection layer. So since in the input is time series, this, um, and also the, the, there's the relationship between the input and output can be memory dependent. We're really learning functionals. Previously in the supervised learning, we're learning functions. So here we're learning functionals, functionals, infinite dimension, because the output can be a general memory dependent function of the input. So this is difficult to do. As a matter of fact, I don't think there is currently any established framework for learning functionals or for learning operators for that matter. Okay. Now, the recurrent neural network philosophy, so the, the, typically the, in, the, in the machine learning literature, this kind of uh, problem is dealt with using recurrent neural network. The idea there is that we can model this memory dependence through introducing hidden units, namely by introducing some hidden units, one can reduce the problem to learning functions. So there will be no memory dependent, no memory dependence. And we just have these complicated functions to learn. For those of you who know about Moritz Wanzig, this is exactly the opposite of Moritz Wanzig. Moritz Wanzig is a reduction, you know, reduced elimination of variables and replaced by memory dependence. Here we are unraveling memory dependence by introducing hidden units. Okay, so again, there's lots of work done already, and you can see this. The, the talks at the Fields Institute workshop, there are lots of interesting talks related to this kind of issue. But I'm gonna examine this as a supervised learning problem. So the question to ask is that there, st there, there are standard issues that we're interested in supervised learning, we're learning functions. For example, approximation theory and optimization. So in approximation theory, we are, you know, we have function of uh, convergence rates, error and now error, uh, uh, and, estimates of this type, where this is a target function, this is some machine learning model, and then the, uh, the error is controlled by something like this, where we hope that the, the alpha is independent dimension. You know, classically, alpha would be like something like one over D, that's depending on dimension, and that's the curse of dimensionality, where you know, we're hoping that the, the, some of the neural network models would succeed in making alpha independent of dimensionality, and indeed, that's possible to do as you can see from the review article I uh, mentioned earlier. So that's the one issue of the uh, approximation. Here, the main interest in rates and, and also this error constant. The second issue is optimization. Can we train? So can we succeed in training the neural network, reduce the training error to zero or small? And does the model generalize after we finish training and we look at testing, do we get a you know, good test accuracy? Now, this kind of issue has been studied for, uh, for supervised learning of functions. That's what the review article I mentioned was, was about. But here, we're talking about supervised learning of functionals. So there are new issues that arise. So I'm going to examine this, these new issues you know, uh, using linear model. You can see even in the, at the level of linear model, there's still some interesting issues that arise. So the setup is that the input x is a function, is, 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 a, is, a, is a function from time to d dimension. So t is the uh, independent variable here. And output is also a time series, a function of time. And we have a linear dependence of the input and output. 
by rich representation theorem, the, the output can always be represented like this, where rho is some sort of density. So x is the input variable. So we, we're going to look at a linear recurring neural network, linear recurring neural network in the continuous time. So we look at, um, so it, it can be represented like this, where this, these C, W, U uh, are the parameters. So these are matrices and this is a vector. This kind of a linear recurring neural network gives rise to a hypothesis space that looks like this. We just plug in and you will get <coughs> that, just plug this into here. You write down the possible expressions of y hat that you know these guys can be written in, in terms of this. So this is the hypothesis space where these w's, you know, these guys are the parameters here are, are again c, w, and u. Okay, so <clears throat> the question we're interested in first approximation rate of the functionals by those in the hypothesis space, and secondly, what about of Optimization. Okay, so the first theorem, so is as follows. You know, forget about this. This you know, this is another universal approximation theorem, which is not really important. What we're, what what's really interesting is the approximation rate. So this says that if under some smoothness condition, if suppose the output is has alpha plus one derivatives, where alpha can be a fractional number, and suppose that these guys decay exponentially fast with some exponent beta, then the, the error, the convergence rate is, is approximated by this, where you have m to the alpha, and then there's coefficient, which is the one over beta. And gamma here is the, oh, sorry, gamma here is the bound. So let's, if you look at this error rate, okay, what's important about this error rate is that this, the, the, the um, convergence rate depend on alpha. And alpha is the regularity. Alpha is, this, is the regularity parameter here. Okay. Now, in the case, <clears throat> in the case when if, if the uh, um, kernel, if the functional that has a memory that depends on like this, where omega goes to zero, alpha becomes one over omega. So that's a simple calculation one can do. So in this case, the, the alpha is one of omega, if, which means if, if you want to reduce this error to epsilon, then the number of parameters needed is, uh, sorry, alpha is like omega, sorry, alpha is like omega. Um, the number of parameters needed goes like epsilon to the minus one of omega. So as omega goes to zero, this you know, is like one over d. It, 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 okay, is this like the D? So omega is like one over D. So here we have a cursive memory where dimensionality D is replaced by one over omega. So that's a new feature. As you can imagine that if the memory is really, really, really long, long memory, then there's something must go wrong. And that's what exactly what this means, what this says. So that's the first remark. The second, Remark, let's look at optimization. So we know look, when we look at the optimization problem, the training. The target function, the risk here is the following thing, that the difference between the target functional and the, the functional in the hypothesis space. And if we written out that explicitly, that's this. Okay, the parameter here again, is C, W and, and W and U. And then this is the, just the gradient descent dynamics. If you look at this, the, the gradient descent dynamic, you will see this kind of behavior. So this is a, a simple case where the, um, the, the, the uh, function now h is just given by some, remember this, uh, the, the function of h is given by some kernel function rho and rho is just the exponential sum, you know, e to the minus t, some, some exponential sum. And then, you know, you have this nice behavior here. But suppose your rho is like error function, error function. Then you, you have this, you know, long plateau. The shaded area is the fluctuation, size of the fluctuation. If you do different, select different um, training 
for uh, di different initialization stuff, you know, like stuff and stuff like that, you would get these um, fluctuations in the training dynamics. And with the average is this solid line. You see this long plateau as you train. And if you, you know, if you train lower in system, you also see this long plateau. So the natural question is, what is the source of this plateau during training? So let's look at the gradients. It's, this is the sort of roughly the expression for the gradient. Let's look at this. So, so there's an exponential term here, and this is a residual term. So you might get into a situation for which the gradient is small, but J, the, the objective function is not small. That can happen when the residual is small, it is large at the places where, uh, sorry, the, uh, where, where the exponential term is small. So this is small, but this is still large. And that's when, that's when the memory is very, very long. Okay, so somewhere in the future, you know, back in the past, the error is still bad, it still is big, but it's still, you know, because the memory is long, so it's still affecting the, um, uh, the, um, the, 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 the residual at the current time. <clears throat> we can look at this more explicitly by choosing rho to be this form. So where the first top part is just sum of exponential. So this is a nice. And the second part, we choose to be this, where, you know, where rho zero is some spike-like function. Think of it as a delta function. So the memory is controlled by this lag, one over omega. So if the omega is small, memory is long. Let's you know, choose target to be this kind of a target and see what happens during training. And this is what happens if you look at the training error, you know, the, 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 which is the blue line. And if you calculate the gradients, let's look at this, this here, you can see that the training error has a very, very long plateau. And where the gradient is small, this is, exponential, this is, this is the uh, um, exponential scale, where this is, is log scale. This is, yeah, I think this is called log scale. Anyway, and, but, the, but the gradient is very small during this whole plateau. But, you know, the training error is not small. And these different pictures are just different values of omega. Oh this is the, or one over omega. This is the one over omega ten, and this is one over omega, you know, eleven, fifteen. And then all of us at this point, the gradient has a spike, and then you can see the training error reduces all of a sudden, and then it keeps being flat plateau again. So this is the error source of the um, of the uh, plateau where there's a long memory effect. One can sort of analyze this um, in some way. So what this theorem says is that the, this time scale for the plateau looks like this. You have this exponential e to the minus, you know, one over omega. Remember, you know, omega is the is the um, one over omega is the uh, is the range of the of the memory. So this is the exponential dependence on the range of the memory. And this can be also look, uh, seen numerically where, you, where we plot the plateau time against the one over omega. You can see this, you know, almost, this is the log of, uh, uh, on the log scale. You can see almost linear behavior here. And this is the time where it's similar to this picture where you see the parameter, you know, almost gets stuck. And then after a very long time, the parameter started to change. And this is that, the time you have to wait in order for the parameter for, uh, for the parameter to have significant change is called the separation time. It also has this nice logarithmic behavior, and this not just occurs in the simplified uh, setting; it also occurs generally. This is a sort of a general nonlinear model, uh, and this is when you replace um, the uh, activation function by tench, activation function still by tench, by but trained uh, train by Adam. And I'm reducing the plateau, you can see that's also what's uh, seen uh, in practice, but there's still, you know, tend to be plateauing kind of effect. Okay, so this part says that 
when we consider time series learning, supervised learning of time series, um, there are additional problems in, in, the, in the training and an approximation due to the long memory effect. So let me sort of summarize. I, um, so what do we want to achieve through this effort? We want to develop new training algorithms, new models and new algorithms, algorithms for deep learning. And I show you some example. In particular, I show you this maximum, maximum principle-based training algorithm. I show you that you know, convergence is much faster than stochastic gradient descent. But I didn't say that it's much more efficient than the gradient descent. That's because the maximum, the, the optimization that we need to do at each time step is a little bit more expensive than the usual gradient descent. But I'm sure, I'm confident that there are rooms for improvement, okay? But this is one issue that needs to be examined very, very carefully in order to see whether there's a real advantage of maximum principle-based algorithm. But in any case, this is a new kind of idea that's not seen in the usual, you know, STD kind of a paradigm. But it, it's suggested very naturally from the standard of system control theory viewpoint. The second thing is associated with the model reduction. Model reduction is an Asian topic in applied mathematics. Very, very important and very popular. I also show you examples, uh, and, and, uh, some examples. In particular, I show you this Bernard convection problem and how it reduced to Lorentz-like systems. But that's not good enough. We really need to work with many, many more examples in order to make sure that this kind of model reduction is indeed the way to go. And there are other issues. It's not just that we see compare, you know, accuracy, short-term accuracy and long-term you know, um, uh, correctness. It's also interoperability. It's also, you know, other things. So that needs to be looked at further. And then supervised learning of time series, I show with an example of linear dynamics, linear recurrent neural networks, how I mean, there's new, already new issues that comes into play, the memory effect. And there are more issues, of course. So all these needs to be looked at. Uh, much more carefully. Okay, this is what I plan to say, and thank you for your attention. I'll stop here. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, so we'll take questions after uh, Robert Mackey's uh, small presentation. Well, uh, Weinan, many thanks for Hi. the uh, fantastic talk. There was so much material. Hi that uh, I feel overwhelmed, but at least um, it's a really good uh, way to start off our, our SIG. So um, uh, I was just going to s say a few things, a reminder about how our SIG uh, will, will work, but, but, uh, but Boumedien, uh, I think maybe it's best to take uh, questions for Wayne-Ann first. Ah, oh, okay, because I thought the presentation was shorter, yeah, so, okay. Yeah. I only have one slide, and it's really just right. a summary of uh, SIG. Yeah, all right, okay. So any uh, uh, questions from uh, the audience to uh, Wayne and Earth? Yeah, if you have questions, like write, write on the chat, and then uh, you can, um, or you can unmute yourselves. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Enrique, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Do you need to unmute him? Yeah. 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 Can you unmute yourself, Enrique? Yeah. Now it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne, and for the talk. So. Can the maximum principle be applied when the width of the neural network varies along the different layers? Yeah, you can, yes. Um, it, although there is not a theorem proving that maximum principle is valid in that case. Maximum principle is valid in the continuous case. In the case, 
in the class of control theory, there are common examples. I'm sure you know this better than I do. Um, in principle, you can actually try it and you know, it seems to work. So, but how, how do you take account? I mean, I, that looks like difficult, right? It's like a switching system in which the dimension, if you look to the Euclidean dimension in which the dynamical system evolves, is switching, right? From one dimension uh, to how do you okay, let me mention um or you just freeze the no, switch no, no, I, and you it, apply it, in the, the the maximum principle is just KKT condition, right? Except that you have a max. You replace one of the gradients by by actually max uh, maximization. So as you know, I think you can still write down the KKT condition, just replace the gradients with respect to the control in zero by Max. That's it. Mm -hmm. So I would say yes. Okay. That's still you can still write down. Yeah. What is not so clear is a notion of a, a joint, maybe right or the, the, a joint is just the um, it's just the um, the um, control. Mm -hmm. Sorry, no, the um, the Lagrange like, like multiplier right. because of, you have this control. Uh, you have the dynamics as the um, as the as the constraint. So the adjoint is just the uh, Lagrange multiplier. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Johan Sarkas. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, this very nice presentation. Um, I have a question concerning the the double descent uh, phenomenon that you probably uh, know uh, in in deep learning. And when you have overparameterized models and you exactly interpolate the training data that you can still have good generalization. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think uh, the, the framework that you outlined, can it also shed a new light on, on this uh, important phenomenon that has not yet completely been understood? I think it's, I'm not sure, um, okay. So my experience has been that if you, for real neural network models, it's not easy to come up with double descent, actually. You have to work very, very hard to see double descent. Double descent occur, occurs extremely clearly when look for the um, random feature model. And you can understand that phenomena very clearly. There, we have a paper you know, written about, on this, basically because you, you have, it's really basically the resonance phenomena. Namely, there are some eigenvalues being small. And when the number of data points is equal to the number of features, there's some resonance, m equal to n. That's bad because some eigenvalue goes to zero very fast. And that gives rise to a peak in the error because in the error, it's like there's something like one over that eigenvalue. But it occurs very slowly also. So I, I think that that's basically understood. And for real nonlinear models like neural networks, as I said, you have to work extremely hard. The usual kind of training wouldn't give you uh, double descent phenomena. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Now, next question, uh, someone A A M A L H. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is regarding the uh, the a dynamical system, sorry, the machine learning for dynamical systems, the RNN framework that you talk about at the end. Mm -hmm. um, one of the problems that you mentioned in the part before is, is about under, the underlying physical structure of a model reduction problem. Is there any consideration in the RNN framework for considering the same sorts of problems? So if we know something about the physical structure of the system, can we ensure that the, the model reflects that? Yes, the answer is yes, but um, I didn't have, you know, actually I wish to talk about this, but we didn't have enough rights. Uh, the results are not complete enough, but actually, yes, there we have very clear evidence that if you put in a physical structure, it helps training a lot. Yeah, there is uh, Cesar, are you there? Did you have a question? Cesar uh, Kiroda. Um, yeah, hello, thank you for your talk. Actually, the question that they just asked, they just asked you is the same question I had, basically how to, when 
if you have a recurrent neural network and you try to feed it itself outside the training data to produce further time steps of prediction, how do you actually ensure that they will stay with the physical um, model that you train it with? And how do you, any ideas on how you like, mm -hmm. don't let the model to detach too much from the reality has seen before or like the divergence um, to reduce the divergence of the model? Yeah, so yeah, same thing. I wish that I, yes, this is the one thing I, I wanted to talk about, about it, but it wasn't ready. Yeah, Peter Tienio. Yeah, hi. So it's a it's great talk, and I was thinking uh, in your in your last analysis of, of the plateaus. Um, mm -hmm. How does this? It must have some correspondence to the original work of Benji and Frasconi on the vanishing gradient um, in the um, attractive sets where the gradient. In the what? Sorry. Yeah. So I just want to something. ask you about this, if you have any insight. In in the what? Sorry. Um, so what is the relation of the of your analysis that you showed us towards the end of the plateau mm -hmm. uh, to the original work of Benji and Frasconi on vanishing gradients um, mm -hmm. when they show that when you propagate gradient information through time in the neighborhood of attractive sets if you want because you want to latch the information from the past and you just want to latch it in in a, in a neighborhood of attractive sets where the, yeah, yeah. the small when you propagate it through time. So that was their explanation of plateaus. And I just yeah, okay. to, yeah. Yeah, the, the, I, I, yeah, see what you said, sorry. Yes, um, well, there are many, first of all, these plateaus and vanishing gradients, that's, that's, um, that's a, it's sort of a general phenomenon in that regard, it's very much the same. Um, here, it's just the vanishing gradient comes from different origin. So this is just memory effect. So there is, is a, um, you know, convergence of attractive sets. Right. So I was like thinking because the memory is related in their, in their ideas, the memory was related with the, the idea of latching the information and in order to keep the information from the past, meaning, you know, some sort of memory, you actually need an attractive set. And that was like the... Um, no, that I'm not sure. Here, I, this is a pure linear dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, I see. Okay, I see. That's the linear dynamics. So that's the difference. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, You're okay. Uh, next, uh, Shiba Bharat, did you have a question? Uh, hi. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, can you point to some advances in using the geometry of phase space structures in improving learning theory for high dimensional problems? Geometry, so some, something like symplectic, you mean? Yes, yeah, symplectic and also like uh, normally hyperbolic invariant manifolds and stable and unstable manifolds and including them in the algorithms to improve learning. Okay, so I, I have to say I haven't thought far enough in that, you know, that's pretty far um, how one can do that. And right now we're just looking at the simplest thing to do to the one can incorporate, namely deceptive structure. A lot of examples that we're interested in are deceptive, maybe Stokes equation is, right. is one example. So we're just, 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 just that. What you are asking is much more advanced. So I guess, you know, maybe that's next step. Okay. okay. Particularly when you have hyperbolic dynamics that you just said, then yeah. yes, maybe, yeah. Yeah, okay. Now next question, uh, Jose Antonio. Yeah. Hi, uh, hi, hello, Wenani. Hey. Uh, I'm Jose. Uh, I just uh, have a general question about uh, one of the comments that you, you did at the beginning of, uh, in the first part of the talk. You were mentioning about the potential use of the gradient flow structure of the equation in the sense of Wasserstein. I would like mm -hmm. uh, to know if you can elaborate a bit more on the ideas that you have uh, that, uh, for which this could be useful for in terms of the theory or in terms of the practical uh, implementation of algorithms. Actually, at this point, it's a, it's a bit of a disappointment um, in terms of theory. So initially, the, I, okay, by the way, that, that I should mention, I forgot to mention, I think, that this kind of a structure, the Wasserstein uh, gradient flow structure uh, was observed, was identified in the sequence, um, sets of four independent work called mean field training, you know, mean field limit of um, 
um, of um, grid descent dynamics for two-layer neural networks. So one, op one obtains these Wasserstein flows, uh, Wasserstein gradient descent structure, and was hoping that optimal transport theory would be useful. But uh, until now, not very much, because the functional is not displacement convex. So we don't know how to, um, so, so results from optimal transport theory don't work right away. Um, and we need to identify new kinds of structure, and that's not clear yet. In terms of uh, algorithm, I already shown example that if you, from this kind of a continuous model, one can discretize. You know, if you use the simplest discretization like particle method, you would just recover the gradient descent. But you don't have to. You can you can discretize with smooth particle method, for example. You can discretize with spectral method. You can discretize with you know other methods, and then you would get new models. As a matter of fact, with smooth particle method, it, the performance is actually better than point particle method. So this has been observed. Okay, thank you. Victoria, do you have a question? Um, yes, thank you so much for your talk. I was just wondering, for the um, generalized Onsager principle to the Onsager net, um, you talk about finding a good set of general generalized coordinates h and then basically determining the coefficients in m w and v and i was wondering if you know a priori the dimension of those generalized coordinates or if that's something you learn as well that's a very good question so this is called model selection and no we don't have a good ideas i mean this is like when you do clustering how many clusters you need to do you know, we don't have good ideas. There are ideas to try, but I would I would say at this point, we don't have good ideas. So we're just trying three, four, five, and stuff like that. All right, thank you. So if there are no other questions, I think I'll back and talk about the, the SIG. Yeah, so thanks ever so much, uh, Wayne-Nan, for, for your very inspiring talk. Uh, it's uh, a great way to start off. So I just wanted to finish by a, a little summary of what our vision is for this um, special interest group. I put up the slide while the questions were going, so uh, it's hardly necessary for me to read through it, but we plan various things like uh, maybe a monthly colloquium, uh, workshops on specific topics that uh, people would like to propose, tutorials I think would be useful. Uh, I'm thinking particularly here of the possibility of tutorial for uh, other groups in the Turing Institute, but it can be broader than that. But there are many other groups who maybe could, um, would like to know what dynamical systems techniques or understanding could be good for them. Reading groups, uh, perhaps uh, uh, some of uh, Wayne Ann's papers would be good material for starting this off. Uh, Turing also organizes uh, theory and methods challenge fortnights and uh, we plan to propose one, but uh, we need to come up with what the topic should be. And there's a plan to have a SharePoint for uh, anybody with uh, interests to um, share points of view. The web page is given here. And if you're interested in joining, then I think there's a link, or hopefully there will be shortly a link on this for how to join. And uh, there'll certainly be other information, all the information. Uh, we'll use this website as the conduit for information. And we'd be very pleased if you have suggestions of what you would like to see this special interest group do. Uh, so um, hopefully on the website, there will be a way soon for doing that. But uh, in the meantime, do feel free just to email Boumedien or me. So I think um, we'll, we'll probably close there, Boumedien. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and I say if there are no other questions or comments, so let's uh, thank Wayne and again for his uh, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. And looking forward to your contribution to the SIC. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So the talk would be posted on YouTube. So I'll just uh, uh, share the link later on with everyone. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.